then welcome to today's session on fluid simulation with Mantaflow. And, um, well, yeah, my, name is, my name is Sebastian Baschkis. I'm the one who's been working on fluid simulation for the past two and a half years. And, well, I'm still a computer science student and I'm working together with Niels Ture from TU München. And, well, we've been working on several types of fluids and Today I want to show you some stuff that I've been working on over the past two summers, basically the two Google Summer of Codes that I participated in. And yeah, let's get right into it. Well, this is actually my very first test scene that I created when I started the project. And I just thought it was funny to show you the, the little animation that I made at the time. So this was my very first fluid animation, if you so will. And um, what's interesting about this simulation is that it's super ugly and <laughs> that um, the message is basically that there is so much more room for fluid simulations in Blender. And of course, you can create a much better simulation with the current Blender version, but we are going to make it even better with Matterflow. So here's a short overview of the, the entire project. So it started back in 2014, there was one developer before me who did a Google Summer of Code project as well. So he basically started with the basic smoke simulations and the Python API. And one year later, I picked up the project. So he left by the time and I picked up the project and actually was going to do or was planning or hoping to do a Google Summer of, Proje Code, Summer of Code project. But um, turned out that Blender didn't get selected that year, so I just worked on the project by myself as part of my bachelor thesis. And yeah, I finished fire effects, high resolution smoke effects, you know, the wave lit noise that you know from Blender already. And then the next year, 2016, I actually got selected into the Google Summer of Code project. And that was the year where I started with the integration of liquid effects. So it turns out that liquid and smoke are actually, from the developer's perspective, very similar. So it made a lot of sense to move the liquid into the smoke modifier. And that sounds maybe sounds a bit counterintuitive, but um, that's the way Mantaflow works. And so what I did is I created this unified Mantaflow solver in Blender, and so everything, everything is unified, the cache is unified, and it just makes things a lot easier. And well, this year I did a second project and was slightly different. I worked on um, flip effects, or flip, the flip side, the flip particles, and also the secondary particles, which you already know from, from Blender. I think there is drop, tracer, and flow particles already, and I added to Mantaflow even bubble effects. And then the second part of my Google Summer of Code project was the fluid guiding part. And that basically is um, a technique which allows you to enforce a velocity field onto a fluid simulation. And this creates a artistic motion, if you so will. Well, yeah, now it's 2017 and Blender 2.8 is on the shelf or nearly. And well, I'm at least hoping that we can get this integration into Blender 2.8 and so that you all can play with it. Yeah. Next up, I have two papers for you because, as you know, behind every good algorithm, there is some science and some people who think about it. And these are the two papers that will influence my project a lot. The first one is the one on the left-hand side, the narrowband flip for liquid simulations. And the idea that the authors had is actually quite straightforward. Um, you have at the bottom right, you have the simulation where you have a liquid where the entire volume of the liquid is filled with flip particles. And if you think about it, this is actually quite a waste of memory and computation time because in the end, what actually makes the fluid or the liquid look good is just the surface. So the idea that the authors had was to say, okay, let's just 
model the surface, let's make a narrow band where the particles live in, and simulate just that. Just that. And so you can see we have at the top scene you have 100,000 particles, and at the bottom scene, for the same scene, you have six times as much particles. And this saves a lot of computation time. So it's quite an improvement. And the good thing about this paper is that the authors already implemented the entire um, algorithm in Mantaflow, so it's actually quite easy to port it over to Blender. It's just a matter of pushing the files over to Blender. And the second paper is the one on fluid guiding, which was published just this year. It's primal dual, op dual optimization for fluids. And in this paper, or part of this paper, deals with the idea of having this target velocity grid, which you then take and enforce onto your simulation. So in this case, you have this little smoke inflow, and in the background you can see the, the velocity field in it, giving this spiral-like rotation, and that rotation is then in the pressure solve applied onto the actual smoke density field. And actually what's, what's so nice, or what, what I wanted to show with these two papers is that every time we get one of those advances in research, with Mantaflow we can directly apply it into or port it over to Blender. So it's actually very easy. Yeah, let's talk a bit about Blend, uh, Mantaflow itself. So Mantaflow itself is actually a fluid simulation framework for research. And um, it's mainly used by professors and PhD students to test out the algorithms. But um, they also have a very nice GUI, as you can see here on the left-hand side. You can view the, uh, each of the grids that you have in your simulation. For example, in this scene, it's showing the obstacle grid. You have the sphere in the, in the middle, and this is the obstacle. And yeah, the entire Manta flow is based on C++, so it's fast enough for Blender as well. It has a plugin-like structure or architecture, and this makes it quite easy to develop new algorithms. For example, when I worked on the fire effects, I just had to write the algorithms, put them into a plugin, and copy that plugin over to Mantaflow. And then in a next step, from a Python theme, I was able to just call the functions and have my simulation running. So and then I'm at my next point, and that is the Python scenes. So the way you interact with Mantaflow is directly through Python. So you have a Python script, and there are several building blocks. So at the top, you always declare your, your, your solver object. So that can be either 2D, 3D. Then you can set the domain size, those sort, sort of things. And later on, you say, OK, what, what data structures do I need? What grids do I need? Do I need particle systems? And I don't want to go to everything that's on the slide, but the main idea is that you can break down the script, or you can tear it apart. That's basically what I did in Blender. You can tear it apart and have those Python snippets, as I call them. And these Python snippets um, are callable from Blender. So you can call them at any time in your simulation and say, OK, I want to change my solver object, change the resolution, and just you just call the snippet, and it gets ex executed and changes your, your setup. And this is actually quite convenient, because it makes the whole process of on one hand, it makes the process of development very easy. You can ex export the, the scene as a Mantaflow script. So to say you reverse engineer your simulation, so you have it in Blender, and then port it over to Mantaflow, and then debug your code. But that's not the point. That's just the development side. The major point is to have a setup that's suitable for the future node editor. And the node editor is still a future project. But um, Niels and I think that this is the perfect basis for such a node editor. And I mean, other platforms like I think Houdini has a node editor, and it would just make sense to have a, a node editor in, in Blender as well. So yeah, now let me talk about a bit that 
a bit of the stuff that changes and a bit of the stuff that remains the same. Because um, with smoke and fire, for example, um, the algorithms that are in MantaFlow are pretty much the same that are in Blender already. So it's just a part of the code, or the, there's no too much difference. So when you use the new smoke simulator, you will use the, the MantaFlow simulator, but you won't see much difference. Another thing that I'd like to mention is, um, if you've played around with the smoke simulator, you know that there is the adaptive domain. And with MantaFlow, unfortunately, this won't be possible because of the way it has organized its memory. And I don't see this changing anytime soon, so this won't be possible. However, I think, as I mentioned earlier, there are quite a few optimizations, like the narrowband with the flip liquids, which make up for this, for this shortcoming. And so these are some of the new, new things, like the flip liquids, then adaptive time stepping. Adaptive time stepping is uh, when you have um, two frames, frame one, frame two, and you compute in between those frames extra computation steps. This is especially useful when you have very fast simulations. And basically, you can just toggle it on and off, and it works automatically. And then, of course, the other two parts that are new are the fluid particles and the fluid guiding that I worked on this summer. And yeah, that's also a bigger change. OK. Um, the rest of this talk will focus on the new parts, so that's what's highlighted in the box. And before I forget it, I want to uh, mention this terminology change because it's actually a bit uh, different in the current blender. Current blender uses fluid for liquids, and it's actually a bit misleading because smoke is a liquid, and uh, sm smoke is a fluid, and liquid is also a fluid. So just keep that in mind when using the new simulator that you will see a fluid modifier, and inside the fluid modifier, you find subtypes, liquid, and smoke. It's just terminology cleanup. OK. So now I've been using the term flip the entire time. And maybe some of you don't know what flip actually is. Flip stands for fluid implicit particle. And what that means is that the entire simulation is actually a particle simulation. So the particles track the surface, and then in a later step, you can generate a mesh from those particles. So the mesh is actually just uh, an addition. And um, yeah, for the cache, this makes also sense. You can then <coughs> choose between, the, between simulating the just the mesh or just the particles or both. And this is really the mesh and the particles are really just the outcome of your simulation. And here you can see one of those really high resolution splashes. This is 512 divisions, and you can really see in the middle the high detail where you see where you can see all the 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 particles in the scene. Yeah. Okay, here I have a small comparison of the current blender and the blender with Mantaflow version. So at the top half you see the this is the current uh, Blender fluid simulation, as it is right now. And what's interesting about the, the splash, or what most people complain about in the splash, is that the drops are actually not real drops. They are these little like strands or strips. They are, I mean, they look OK, but not too realistic. And with Mantaflow, it, it changes a bit. You get a more uniform splash. And yeah, it's really up to the to artist to say what looks well, what what looks better or what looks more realistic. And I would just say that with MantaFlow, you always get a bigger splash, so to say. It's much more detail in the splash and just a richer fluid simulation. All right, so now let's move on to the first demo that I have for you. And let me just change to Blender, open up the first scene. And well, this is what I talked about earlier. This is the new Fluid UI. And in the Fluid modifier, you have 
different types of domain. You right now you have just two. You have just the gas type and the liquid type. So gas would be smoke or fire, and liquids is just liquids. So it's inside one modifier. Here you can see the old modifier, which will hopefully be removed very soon. And yeah, this is the single one, the single fluid modifier. And another thing I wanted to show you is the fluid cache. So I mentioned earlier, flick liquids is either just particles or just or mesh, or you can mix and match them. And this is what the UI at the bottom here is all about. It's on one hand, the surface format that you define, so that would be the mesh. And you can also toggle the volumetric format, which would give you the, the flip particles. OK. And that's all for this demo now. I will come back to the scene in just a second. Let me just go back to the slides and move on to fluid particles. So I've been talking about flip particles the entire time. So it's the fluid implicit particle that makes the surface. Here on the right hand side, you can see those two images. The top one is exclusively flip particles, and the bottom one is overlaying a mesh and the fluid particles. And the most interesting about fluid particles is actually the secondary particles. And you know them from Blender already. And uh, the same well, the same technique is now implemented in Mantaflow as well. So you have drop, bubble, float, and tracer particles. I think bubble particles doesn't even exist in the current Blender, so it's and one new type of particle. And then I put there that um, the upper three ones, so drop, bubble, and float, are recycled. And what that means, as you'll see in just a second, is that these particles run through a particle life cycle. So the drop particle is generated, then converted into a bubble, and then again converted into a float. And I have another visualization here. And this is basically just the different fluid particles stacked on top of each other. So you have the tracer particles that fill up the entire volume, then the float particles on the surface, bubble and drop particles, which make the crown of this splash, and then flip particles, which also um, are at the surface. All right, now I have this little uh, sketch here to show you how the particles are actually generated. So flip particles, it's clear, they are at the surface and they are generated automatically. You don't have to worry about them. You can just visualize them, but everything else is up to the simulation itself. Now to drop particles. How do you generate a drop particle? Well, if you think about it, it's actually, or if you think about where you have drop particles, then you'll quickly realize that drop particles usually uh, are generated at very fast-moving fluid objects. So for example, you have this wave, and at the tip of this wave, you would want to generate a drop particle. So the first check that you have to perform is, OK, is the shape convex in this? Or is, it, is it the tip of the, the fluid? And is it fast enough? And when you have made those checks, you can generate a, flip part, a drop particle, send it off on its own way with its own velocity, and then right at the bottom, I put this Euler's method. This is just the formula. If you don't have to understand it, this is just a formula that is used to compute the next particle position. Yeah. So this particle is on its own way. It's generated. There's some gravity applied on it, and then it's falling onto the surface. And once it hits the surface, it gets converted into the bubble particle. The bubble particle itself will then get some buoyancy so that it floats to the surface. And once it's at the surface, it gets converted into a float particle. OK? And this is the particle life cycle I was talking about. And so you have the drop particle is generated, and everything else happens on its, on its own. Now on to yeah, it's the life cycle. Now on to the tracer particles, because the tracer particles are uh, a bit on their own. So how they work is basically that um, you have a probability. And this probability tells you how likely 
you want to generate a particle in a cell. So for example, if you say, okay, trace the particles with 100% uh, probability means that in every cell I would generate a particle. 50% we would mean, okay, on average every second cell gets a tracer particle. Yeah, and the same can also be used for float particles. So if you want to add some more float particles, you can add the same um, technique with probability and sample more float particles at the surface. Okay, that's this theoretical part. Now let's go to the more practical part. And that's this demo scene. And in this demo scene, I've already baked it. I have this um, inflow object at the top. It's just a liquid splash. It's not a particularly high resolution, but that doesn't matter for now. It's just a splash. And what I'd like to do now is maybe stop it at frame, yeah, frame 30. And now we can go in the into the fluid UI, into the fluid particles UI. And here is, what you see is all the different particle types. It's a bit grayed out right now, but um, that's because of the cache is already baked. And um, yeah, I've enabled all of them. And what you can then do is you can go on to the um, particles interface. And you'll see that for each particle type, you have a an, an known particle system. And we can take a look at them and you'll see, okay, here you can see the flip particles at the surface of the fluid. Then we have the drop particles flying around in the, in the air, so to say. Then moving on a bit into the fluid, we have the drop particles at uh, the, the bubble particles. As you can see, they rise to the surface. And then we have um, at the surface the flow particles. Again, floating only at the top. And these are actually quite similar to the, to the flip particles, but they are actually originating from the drop, drop particle. And then at the end, we have tracer particles in the entire volume of the fluid. So these move with the flow of the fluid. OK. So I think once you play with these particles, it just makes a lot more sense. And it's actually quite fun to play around with. OK. Moving back to the slides, um, let's move on to fluid guiding. So fluid guiding is, as I told you, a method which allows you to enforce a velocity field onto a simulation. And Blender or Manta Flow itself will then ensure that the whole um, simula that the motion stays divergence free. That basically means that there is no um, unrealistic behavior happening. And so the way we approach this problem or this problem of creating a fluid guiding scene is that we say, okay, we need a guiding object. So for example, we take the cylinder object and we say, okay, we animate it. For example, we could say, okay, this cylinder rotates around the z-axis. And this way it creates a velocity field. This velocity field can then be taken and handed on to the internal mantra pressure solve. And then we can also define blur and blur and the weight. And the, the blur is, you can see on the, on the right hand side, basically just the size of the vortices, vortices in, the, in, in the guiding. And yeah, this will give you something similar to this. This is something as uh, I, I rendered, took quite some time to render. But what you can see is that the smoke follows this guiding motion in the against uh, counterclockwise. So actually this is, I mean, the possibilities with this are endless. You can perform any, mo any motion you can think of. All right, so now let's take a look at fluid guiding. I've also prepared a small scene for that. And 
Yes, that's the tornado demo. Uh, so, okay, we have again we have a domain object, and in this case it's a gas domain for the for the smoke effect. Then we have in the center we have this small torus, which will be our smoke inflow. And then we have this cylinder, which I showed you earlier. And the cylinder is animated and will rotate around the z-axis and will thus create the velocity field. And once we play the simulation, you can see, OK, it generates the motion and the density follows the animation. All right? So I mean, the, the cylinder example is probably the most uh, straightforward example, but you could also say, OK, um, let's uh, create, a, create a path and let's um, let an, a guiding object follow this path, and then we get a fluid motion along this path. It would be also possible. OK. I am wanted to show you one more thing. I wanted to show you the fluid exporter, and that's down here. So I told you that you can reverse engineer your simulation by exporting the scene as a Mantaflow script. And that's probably um, only for the developers of you. But what you can, can do is we can step to like this frame, export our scene, then bring up Mantaflow. So Mantaflow is started from the terminal. And we can feed in the, um, the Mantaflow script, run it, and what you will get is you will get the Mantaflow GUI. And the Mantaflow GUI basically gives you, um, or gives you the ability to step thr through the, the individual grids. So, and what you can see here is the density field. So this is, this is just a two-dimensional view from the top. And we could also say, OK, we want to step into the simulation. So now you can see the velocities. You can scale up the velocity, scale down the velocities. And there are a couple of more grids. So this is a density grid, and there's a pressure grid, obstacle grid. External forces, guiding field, weight, density, and so on. So it's actually quite fun to play around with, but um, yeah, it's mostly it. It's mostly used for debugging and developing new stuff. All right, so then let's switch back to the presentation. And uh, my last example, I would like to show you a bug that we had, and this bug was reported by Gottfried Hoffmann. And um, this example just shows a bit of the process of how, you, how I solve the problem, or how we get from bug to working program. So in this case, he reported that um, he had this coffee mug and with liquid inflow, and the coffee or the, the liquid simply wouldn't hit the obstacle. And so the problem with this scene was that um, the obstacle was simply too thin. And this can happen because Mantaflow is based on a, on a, or it relies on an obstacle level set, basically a grid. And w when the resolution is too high and the obstacle is too thin, it can happen that it simply doesn't recognize the, the obstacle. And what you can do in this case is you can say, OK, we artificially thicken the obstacle. And what you get here is a thickened version of the obstacle. And this is important for, for Blender Flow so that it actually recognizes the obstacle. OK, so here at the bottom, you see the, the, the level set as it thickens from 0 to 2.5. You can just go to any value and make it thicker. And the second reason why you might not get an obstacle or obstacle collision is that your time step is too big. And that's where the adaptive time stepping comes into play. When you have very fast moving, moving fluids, it, I would say in most of the cases, it makes a lot of sense to enable adaptive time stepping. It will 
take a lot more time to compute those extra steps, but in the end, it will give you the effect that you're looking for. So I would always switch it on if possible. Yeah, and here you can see at the bottom, this is what happens when you don't have adaptive time stepping. You might get a situation where the particles are actually one step ahead and never knew about the, the obstacle. All right. A couple of next steps that are on my agenda, at least. So some to-dos for 2.8 are especially just bug fixes. So I'm not going to do any more features, I'd say. I'm I'm just going to focus, focus on bugs, and therefore I heavily rely on bug reports on, and bug feedbacks bug, uh, from, from Blender artists or from wherever uh, you send me a message. Then, of course, um, next step would be to remove the fluid modifier, the old one, because it's actually not necessary to have two liquid simulators, liquid simulators and the new one should simply replace the old one. And then, of course, uh, next step would be to merge this branch into 2.8 and see how it performs and, yeah, to have more people play around with it. And I also have some ideas for future projects, um, but those projects are definitely after the 2.8 release, I would say. And that is, one, on one hand, the node editor. The node editor, I think it makes sense to have because the entire setup that we have right now implemented would make it or should make it possible to have. And then the, th the second thing, thing is, um, again, fluid particles, but for um, the gas domain. And if you think about it, it would be actually quite feasible to have um, like uh, fire sparks around a fire simulation that are automatically generated and uh, follow the, the motion of the fire. So that would be actually quite a nice effect. Yeah, so that's about it. Um, more information can be found on my Blender wiki. There I have basically all my Google Summer of Code reports and there you can also find um, some tips on how to build the branch and yeah, general stuff just. Another link that I'd recommend you is the website from the research group. There you'll find all the, the papers and also cool videos and simulations. Yeah, and that's about it. And yeah. <laughs> Questions? Two yeah, I'm just gonna start at the left-hand side, yeah. Before you get too keen on throwing away the old fluid simulation, mm -hmm. what's the back compatibility support? If I've got a 2.8 or 2.7, sorry, 2.77 blend file with some fluids in it at the moment, am I not going to be able to run it in your brave new world? Um, you, I mean, it's not going to be compatible because it's a completely different, different uh, approach. The flip has simply has a lot of different settings, so it obviously wouldn't work and wouldn't also make sense to port those settings. So I'd say no, I mean, your old scenes would then probably only work up to 2.79 or whatever, if we decide to remove the fluid modifier, but I would say so, yeah. Yeah, more hands? Uh, do multiple uh, in particle simulations interact with each other? So if I have uh, two smoke simulations, can they interact? Mm, you mean two, diff two separate domains? Uh, I don't know if I can set up uh, one of two uh, uh, spawn objects in one domain, then it would solve the problem. But if I would have uh, two separate simulations, so, I, I mean, if you have two, um, like, smoke inflow objects in one smoke domain, they would interact, yes. But okay. If you, but if you had one smoke inflow and one liquid inflow, they wouldn't work. Okay. And it seems like a pretty robust uh, particle system. Wouldn't it be... Uh to, uh, wouldn't it be possible to replace the old system? 
You mean the entire particle system? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we would do that, I guess, then the entire games community would uh, uh, throw me out of the window because um, <laughs> the, um, I guess uh, the, the current um, particle system in Blender is SPH particle system and that's a lot better for um, real time because everything that you just saw is uh, just heavy computation, so... Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Does the um, the guiding also support um, geometry that's changing in, in like surface to form and stuff? Does that affect the the velocity at all? You mean, for example, uh, like let's say you take that cylinder right and mm -hmm. you throw like a displacement modifier on it and um, you just have it move around a little bit with a texture. Would that affect the uh, the overall um, movement of it as well? Mm, I mean, I would say it should work, but I mean this is really experimental. Even the um, the developers of the fluid guiding didn't know of if the the liquids really work with the guiding. So in theory, it should work, right, but I guess I'll no one has really tried it out yet. I'll test it and I'll yeah. let you know. <laughs> Um, it was a while when I last loaded up Montaflow, but I still have the questions. You said that you don't want to add any new features, um, but right now is um, viscosity as a mm -hmm. setting, is it um, available right now? Mm, not yet. Will you add it before um, 2.8? Hmm, good question. Um, I would say probably not. Um, just because I would rather focus on the bugs that are currently there. But I mean, viscosity is a pretty pretty big feature. In I that guess. case, I would say don't remove Albeam until yeah. viscosity is yeah, a month of Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's one one more thing we have to discuss. Yeah. Because viscosity is currently not supported in month of flow, so that would first have to be developed. And yeah. Yeah, she was. Oh, Hi. Um, from the user point of, point of view, how easy is to um, play with these settings to to achieve uh, desired um, flow of, uh, velocity, or um, for example, for smoke? And mm -hmm. uh, I know um, the old system was quite difficult to you know to you 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 would need to play around and uh, yeah. try different settings, and you know it's more. Um, trial and error to, yeah. to get what you want. Is it going to be easier? I mean, um, I designed the, from the UI perspective, I would say definitely yes, because everything is in one place and that's it. The one thing that, especially with guiding, that would be problematic is that it just takes a lot of resources for the computation. What you just saw was already baked, yeah. but um, if you really crank up the resolution, it can get really, really expensive very quickly. So just keep that in mind. Um, but of course, um, this is also something I would like to improve, um, is the the ability to play around with a low resolution simulation and then later on, uh, when you see that it looks like what I want to simulate the, the big one. Thank you. Another thing, um, can you animate, for example, if using or not, the multi-threads, like uh, the instance to when he hits obstacles, mm -hmm. uh, just to enable it from, let's say, frame 10, 10 to um, 50, and uh, after that, just don't use that. So it's like a quicker computation after that, because the velocity may be when the uh, obstacle, like the um, coffee cup, is mm -hmm. filled up, it's not going to, particles are not going to pass anymore through mm -hmm. the uh, thickness of the object so maybe would be I don't know to don't use any more the multi samples between uh, uh, frames mm -hmm. um, so can be animated that let's say use them between only in 10 frames that you need them um, I mean I don't know exactly what, what you mean. But. Okay, so um, you, 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 use, you use that uh, multi threads because the particles are passing, are very fast and are passing through the uh, you mean coffee the, mug. 
the adaptive yet. time stepping? Yes. Yeah. The adaptive uh, adaptive samples yeah. can be animated. Um, you mean the time steps in between? If this, if they yes, can be I mean, uh, okay, ah. uh, the liquid is going to hit the mm -hmm. mug at frame 10, mm -hmm. and from frame 15, mm -hmm. it's not going to, I, I will not need it mm -hmm. anymore because the velocity is not uh, high, right? So I will not need that thing. Uh, you mean you will not need the obstacle uh, anymore? Or? Yeah. Velocity will not pass through. Yeah, uh, just turn them uh, on and off. Um, animate the adaptive time step. Um, right now, you cannot, but it would be really easy to implement that. I mean, like the, um, I mean, it's similar to the um, inflow, which you can enable and disable yes. and keyframe. Yes, you, I don't think you need them always. Yeah, um, I mean, that would be easy to add. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think here was one question at the front. No, no, not anyway. Yeah, I have a question regarding the the obstacle object. Mm -hmm. Can the obstacle object be animated while it's filled up with water? Yes. And then still be, and the fluid will re react to it. Yeah. So the obstacle can move around, for example. Yeah, for example, you have yep. a character, you want to fill it up with water. Yeah. For example, and then the character the would would move, and the the yep. water inside would. Would direct it? Sure, yeah. In the domain. In the, as long as it stays yes. in the domain, the obstacle, yeah. Okay, thank you. Over here. Question I think here. not anymore. Not anymore? If I've got a physical object, can I float it in your fluids? Or can your fluid only flow around it like a passive object? You mean like. A little ship which floats yes, on this. Yes, a little sh um, ship that floats and is carried by your fluid as part of its simulation. Um, or do I have to animate the ship myself? I think right now you'd have to animate it. But I remember that uh, Niels told me about a paper that he's working on. And I think he's working on it exactly that problem to have floating objects in the simulation. So it's future project, yeah. Are there any plans for optimization of MantaFlow? So like um, maybe better multi-threading, um, faster algorithms, or um, maybe like um, support for graphic cards? Like in Houdini, you got OpenCL mm -hmm. um, accelerated simulations, which mm -hmm. is pretty extreme. Um, not that I know of. I know that they once had um, one of those MantaFlow scenes implemented for CUDA. I think it was the, the Vortex Sheets which was implemented for CUDA. But uh, I don't think there are any plans for that. They are mainly focusing on new papers right now. So, but, um, I mean, we already have in, in Mandaflow the, the entire system is uh, accelerated with either OpenMP or um, TBB. TBB, yeah. So depending on what you're running. So right now, if, you, if you're running on a Mac, it automatically switches to TBB because OpenMP is a mess right now. But um, other than that, it would switch on to OpenMP. Any more questions? OK. That's it.